All right, um, so you've been working on refraction and, uh, and a few other wave effects that didn't make it onto this quiz. So, so I'm going to ask you about some of them today. These are all these are all stolen from almost all of them stolen from old homework problems. Um, the first one is is apply Snell's law in in a straightforward way, I guess, uh, with, with uh, flat interfaces. So so the picture is that there's a light ray coming into through the air into a, a water surface, a water layer. And next to the water layer is a layer of diamond. Not an easy to, an experiment to set up, but anyway. And then, and then next to that, a uh, layer of air. So, so there's a layer of water and a layer of diamond suspended in a, basically suspended in a, in air. And although I didn't write it, the problem certainly would have I'm going to write this angle right here as 47 degrees. Um, the problem certainly would tell you something about how the about the incoming angle. And because it had to tell you something about the incoming angle, and I forgot to put anything like that in, I'm just going to tell you that that particular angle right there uh, of the ray is 47 degrees. Okay, I didn't draw that very well, but whatever. <laughs> Um, water has a higher index of refraction than air, and diamond is higher than water. And so the problem says sketch the path of the ray, this particular ray, through all three interfaces of the, sh of the ray shown, and calculate the angles. So you'll have numbers for the angles, identify all the angles, appropriate angles, and, and sketch a picture of the, of the rays. So I'm going to leave that for you. Maybe I should say one. Let me, let me give you one thing always. Our angles are always defined with respect to the perpendicular, the normal, through the interface. So if I were you, the very first thing I would do, if I had an interface right there, is draw a perpendicular line to that interface. In fact, every time you have a ray coming into an interface, very first thing, sketch a perpendicular line, because all your angles are measured with respect to that perpendicular line. So you're going to need that every step of the way. All right, give me a few minutes. Talk about it all you want. Uh, sketch it out. Okay, so maybe we should talk about this. Um, it's been it's been I don't know six or seven minutes that you've had to work on it. No, it's not long enough to work it all out, but it's probably long enough to get the thinking through. And 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 part of the thinking about it and and understanding how to use Snell's law is is thinking about what that what those angles are because Snell's law has angles in it. Theta 1 and theta 2. And those angles are always measured with respect to the perpendicular line. Where is the angle between the ray and the line perpendicular to the interface? So, so it, when telling you 47 degrees there, I am purposely throwing you a curveball right away. Because that is not an angle that's in Snell's law. Snell's law tells you about the angle theta air here is the angle between the perpendicular line to the interface and the ray. So, so 47 degrees is not the right angle. In fact, 
the right, the correct angle of theta air, I, well, I wrote it there. I wrote 43 degrees, so I, I subtracted 47 from, I did it right, didn't I? Yeah. I subtracted 47 from 90. If, if one of those angles is 47, the other better be 43. The way I drew it, it didn't look like that. I mean, the way I drew it, the 47 degree angle looks smaller than the 43. But anyway, that's just my inability to draw. Um, and, and not the angles. Hopefully when, when a picture like that actually shows up, uh, everything's at the correct angle instead of just what I happen to be drawing. So, number one, draw the perpendicular to the interface where the ray hits the interface. That will give you a way to measure these angles. Like theta air is between that perpendicular and the ray on the side of the air. Theta water. So, so here's Snell's law. Snell's law says N for the air times the sine of that angle theta air, 43 degrees, is equal to the N times the sine of the theta on the other side. That's basically it. Doesn't matter which side is which. The equation's the same if I switch it around. What does matter is that N of air goes with theta air. N of water goes with theta water. So which N is larger? The water. What does N tell you? Well, N is the speed of light in a vacuum, and that's, what we, that's the symbol we use for that is C. Speed of light in a vacuum has, has speed. Uh, light in a vacuum has speed C. Light in any other material is slower than C. It's a smaller number. The speed in water is a smaller number than C, and so C divided by some smaller number gives you a number bigger than 1. So this index of refraction is always going to be 1 or larger than 1. For vacuum, it's 1. For air, it's close to 1. And I didn't write that but uh, I, I ordinarily would. <laughs> Just to remind you, air is, is not very dense. There's not very many molecules. So the, it, when the light passes through air, it doesn't interact with very many molecules, so it only gets slowed down a tiny bit. Negligible amount. In solid, in liquids like water or solid like diamond, the, the atoms are really close together. It's a much denser material in terms of the number of atoms there are in each space. And so the light, as it passes through, have to, has to interact with a, a lot of other things. And that the result of that is just that it slows down. So what happens at the first interface? The way I would suggest that you think about this and so you, so you don't make mistakes. Just be really methodical. The way I, all, the thing I always do first is think about what would happen at the interface if n was the same on both sides. What happens to this ray if n doesn't get larger, doesn't get smaller, but is in fact the same? What does the ray do? Straight through. No effect. So, so what I do is is put that straight through a ray. That's if it doesn't slow down and if it doesn't speed up. If it goes through at the same speed. Now, we know it slows down. So what happens? I can sketch wave fronts here. What happens to those wave fronts coming in as it slows down? Is that they start looking like that. is that they, because it slows down, they start looking like that. And that means their direction has changed. The direction is always perpendicular to the wave front. So the new direction is like that. If they slow down, then the angle between the ray and the water 
and that same perpendicular line that you drew at the beginning, if they slow down, it's a smaller number. So you can think of it as waves slowing down, or you can use Snell's law. Yeah. So that line isn't really straight. It's hitting the interface and then turning a little bit further. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> you, could, you could use the word turning, but turning makes it sound like it's happening slowly. It happens exactly at the interface. The line was going like this. If it had no change in n at the interface, it would have continued on straight. Because n changes abruptly at the interface, the new direction is different. It's still a straight line, but it's a different direction than it was. It bends right at the interface. It changes its direction because the waves slow down. When you go from air, where they're fast, into water where they're slower. And when it changes its direction, it, when it slows down, what happens is that it bends in the direction of the perpendicular. It gets closer to the perpendicular. Now you can see that from Snell's law, I hope. If n is 1 for air and n for water is 1.33, If the n on the left is larger than the n on the right, the only way these things can be equal is if the sine function on the left is the larger of the two, larger than the sine on the right. And that means theta is for air is larger than theta for water. So if n goes up, theta has to go down. What does it mean for theta to go down? Well, theta is measured with respect to this perpendicular line. If theta goes down, that means it gets closer to the perpendicular line. On this side, it's 43 degrees away from the perpendicular line. On the other side, it's a smaller angle. This dotted line would be if it was still 43. I don't want it to be still 43. I want it to be smaller, so I'm going to draw it like that. I could calculate the angle using Snell's law and the two indexes of refraction and a calculator. Any questions on that first? I know that the ray bent because the speed changed because the index of refraction is different. Because the index of refraction is bigger, I know that the, ray, that the wave slowed down. And if it slows down, then it has to bend toward the perpendicular. That angle has to get smaller. If the index of refraction goes up at the interface, then the angle with respect to the perpendicular has to go down. So it has to bend toward the perpendicular. So Snell's law is telling you that these wave fronts that you would draw for things that are moving slower are also telling you that same thing. And, and I hope that the, all those things make sense to you. So this ray is now going through the water. It comes to another interface. A new interface, draw a new perpendicular line. Sketch it in. It hits the interface here. I'm going to sketch it in. I'm going to get this other junk out of the way. Not that. Obviously, I'm not great at sketching in perpendicular lines, but that's another line that's perpendicular to the interface where the ray hits. If this angle right here that we got from the first interface is theta water, and these two interfaces are parallel to each other, which they are, then this angle right here is the same. Just by, I mean, you can, I hope, see that those, two are, that those two are the same if you look at it long enough. So in calculating theta water for the first uh, interface, because these interfaces are perfectly parallel to each other, I'm going to show you one in a, prob a 
a problem in a second where it's not true, but they happen to be parallel to each other, these two interfaces. Um, these two angles happen to be the same. So I know the incoming angle theta water. This incoming angle theta water is a smaller angle than theta air. Theta air was 43, theta water is something smaller. Again, what if the index of refraction hadn't changed? So my way of dealing with that is always think of what happened if it didn't change. And sketch that in a dotted line so you can think about what would happen if the speed was the same. What did the speed actually do? Go up or down? Went down some more. The index of refraction went up, which means the speed of light in diamond, I didn't look this up, but I'm going to assume wherever I stole this from, this person did look it up. Um, maybe they stole it from somebody else, and maybe it was just invented. But I'm going to assume this is right, that, that uh, light in diamond goes slower than light in water. It goes slower than light in air. So what happens at this next interface? Again, slows down. Slows down means even a smaller angle than theta water. Theta diamond is a smaller angle. It is closer to that perpendicular line than theta water is to the, the theta water ray. Sorry, the water ray is to that perpendicular line. Theta diamond is smaller than theta water. Another way to say the same thing. Again, you have Snell's law here, so you could put in the various n for water, sine theta water, n for diamond, sine theta diamond, and calculate theta diamond. Any questions on that one? We just bent it even more because we went even slower. That last ray through the diamond looks like it's curved. I just can't draw very well. It's supposed to be a straight line still. So the diamond one hits an interface. What do you do first when you're trying to draw this kind of thing and it hits an interface? Draw the perpendicular. Draw this perpendicular line. Perpendicular to the interface. All these interfaces are, are vertical, so all the perpendicular lines are horizontal. Again, there'll be a problem coming up shortly where that's not true. Perpendicular to the interface where the ray actually hits the interface. Hits right there. Interface is vertical. Perpendicular is horizontal. If it went straight through, all right, let me fix this. If it went straight through, if there was no change in speed, it would do that. But there is a change. What happens at this interface? Let me draw some, some wave fronts. At this interface, the waves start going faster. They slow down in the water. They slow down even more in the diamond. They come back into the air. They go, they're going approximately what one standardly calls the speed of light in vacuum. They're going really fast again. So if these, wave, if these waves go faster, then, then the wave front ends up getting ahead of where it would have been. And so the new direction, not very good at drawing these, but the new direction is still perpendicular to the wave front. And so this last angle, theta air, if you calculate it, I'm pretty sure that you'll find out that this last angle, theta air, is the same as the 43 degrees. That it comes out at the same angle it went in at. just because these, certain, these interfaces are all parallel to each other. And it ends up in the same medium that it came out of. If they weren't parallel, then, there would either, then the light wouldn't come out at the same angle. It would come out at some different angle. 
which we'll see in a second. Any questions on that? Just step by step, every interface, draw the perpendicular. Sketch it in as a dotted line. Every interface, the way I would do it, sketch the dotted line which shows the ray continuing on if there were no change. And then if it's slower, it's a little closer to the perpendicular line. If the, if the new interface, if the new material medium is slower than the old medium, then the new ray is closer to the perpendicular line. If the new medium has light that's faster than the old medium, then the new ray is farther away from the perpendicular than the old ray. So theta air is a big, bigger than theta water. Theta water is bigger than theta diamond. And then this theta diamond is smaller than the, a lot smaller than the final theta air. Any questions? All right, another situation that, that you've talked about recently. Um, is standing waves. A little bit of, I, I think, probably a little bit of discussion of how standing waves are, are related to musical instruments. We're, we're eventually going to talk about how standing waves are related to um, atomic orbitals and atoms. But, but for right now, we're just the, our only application for right this second is for musical instruments. And so this, uh, this problem tells you the speed of sound in air. This is a musical instrument where, where air is the thing that is, uh, that is oscillating, at least pressure, air pressure. Um, given that the speed of sound in air is about 300 meters per second, and the lowest frequency a human can hear is about 20 hertz. So pretty low sound. That's your... your Dynamic range is something like between 20 and 20,000. Some of you in here, I'm sure, can hear tw more than 20,000. For me, it tops out at about 8,000, 10, or something. I mean, I can't hear anything like a 20,000 sound anymore. Um, what's the shortest tube-like instrument that can produce this very low note? So. So I don't, if, if I, I stole this problem, if I were writing this problem, I would be clearer on what I mean by tube-like instrument. So let me suggest this one. A tube with both ends open. So a flute is a little like that. Uh, a, a piccolo is not. A piccolo is more like an open end and a closed end tube. But a flute is a little like an open, open on both ends basically what's going on with that, with that instrument and with a few others. So what's the shortest tube-like instrument? So I'm going to say this one, open on both ends. What's the shortest instrument that is a tube open on both ends, uh, which can produce a 20 hertz sound, a loud 20 hertz sound? In other words, a standing wave at that frequency. We'll let you talk about it for a few minutes, see what you think and what your explanation of that is. It says draw a clear picture along with your explanation. Has anyone calculated the wavelength of this frequency yet? 17. Oh, shoot, I should have been able to do that. 2 into 34. Um, okay. 17 meters is the wavelength of the sound that we're trying to make.
All right, so, so let me ask you, just when, when we're talking about standing waves, pretty much we're talking about musical instruments making sound, we are talking about standing waves. That's, that's, the, the standing waves are the waves, you, any musical instrument, the strings and the flute, both uh, uh, strings and wind, and any wind instrument, both of those have um, st a standing wave, either the wave on the string, either a mechanical motion of the string, or the air, actual motion of the air, the air pressure going up and down. Uh, they all produce, the, produce frequencies that are loud if they're standing waves. If they're not standing waves of that instrument, then they don't produce a loud sound until you don't hear those waves. You can try to put uh, a wave of the of a non-standing wave frequency in near some tube, and you don't get a loud result. You get loud results with the standing waves. So, so this is essentially a standing wave kind of problem. Um, so, the, the the way to deal with standing waves is to think about nodes and antinodes. And the way I would do it is think about the boundaries. So, let me ask you. So I, I don't know how you might have discussed this in, in discussion lab. Different, different people think of things differently. So let me ask you about pressure fluctuations. So pressure nodes and pressure anti-nodes. When you're near an open end of a tube, so it's the tube at that end is open to the atmosphere, do you expect the pressure to be an anti-node, so it can go up and down a lot? Or do you expect it to be a node? If the pressure is a node, by the way, what, what, is it, what is the pressure? If the standing wave has a node, atmospheric pressure. Sounds are all pressures above and below atmospheric pressure. So if there's a node, if there's no fluctuation, then it's at atmospheric pressure. What do you expect at the end of a tube? At atmospheric pressure? Or, or way up and way down below it. So I kind of expect at atmospheric pressure because it's 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 like uh, in seven B when you had water touching air. I mean they're basically at the same pressure all the time. So if the atmosphere out here stays at stays this constant pressure, then you expect air near here to also be at a constant pressure approximately one atmosphere and not to change very much, not to have wild, large, up and down pressure fluctuations right at this, the interface. So, so, so that means a pressure node at that end. Now, if you're careful, strictly speaking, I think the pressure nodes are just a tiny bit outside the ends. It's just a tiny bit away from the end. But, but I'm going to ignore that tiny bit and say they're at the end. They're a tiny bit away because you actually have to get slightly outside the, the uh, instrument itself before the atmosphere has, has the ability to, to clamp the um, to clamp the pressure at, at atmospheric pressure. So pressure node So if you had thought about anti-nodes at the end, it, it turns out you're going to get the same answer. So in some sense, it doesn't matter. Uh, so if you have nodes at the end, there's a lot of ways of having that. You could have a oscillation that looks like that, where an there's one anti-node in the center. Or should do it in a different place. If you have nodes at the ends, you could have not just one anti-node in the middle, but two anti-nodes. And one node in the middle. Or there are other oscillations. 
Um, let's say we want to produce lambda, a sound with a wavelength of 17 meters. That's what we're trying to do. What would the length of this tube be if lambda was 17 meters? Let's do an easier one. What would the length of this tube down here be if lambda was 17 meters? 17 meters. This would be 17 meters if lambda if lambda is 17 meters and you have that then that tube has to be 17 meters long. That will give you a 20 hertz sound. One of the standing waves is at 20 hertz. What about this one? What if this is the standing wave that's 17 meters? What's L? Eight and a half. Well, so that should be drawn shorter. I mean, if I really want to make this look right compared to the other one, I would draw like that and say, well, this is a shorter tube. You can see that this wavelength here is the same as, or this half wavelength is the same as that half wavelength. That's the shortest tube that will give you a standing wave of 20 hertz. 8.5 meters. How big is 8.5 meters? That's like, I don't know, that's like from the wall to here. You have a flute that plays 20 hertz. You got a 26 foot long flute that you play. You want to play frequencies like that, you need a really long tube. Any questions about that? Okay, we got time for this one. Here's one where the interfaces are not all simple. This is meant to be a, a clear plastic this piece right here is meant to be essentially a clear plastic cylinder. So it's a cylinder like that, and it just goes on and on and on. Let's forget about, I mean, the end is off the picture somewhere. It just goes on and on. Light comes into this face perpendicular to the interface. It's a square interface, a flat interface. But inside this plastic, is a hole. And that hole, I don't know, it's, it's the, a cross section of it is shaped like that. I could say it looks kind of like this. The hole is kind of maybe circular if you look down the axis of the cylinder, but when you look in cross section, you see that it's shaped like that. So it's kind of flattened out. It's like you had a spherical bubble inside the plastic, and then you flattened it out a little bit left to right. So it's taller than it is big that way. Um, the hole, I, I don't care what it has in it, as long as it's either what you think of it, as long as it's either vacuum or air, because both of those have the same index of refraction. So you can make it a hole with air in it, or you can think of it as a hole with nothing in it. And it doesn't matter. As long as it's not a hole filled with plastic or diamond or some big index of refraction. So the plastic, well, first of all, the air index of refraction of 1. So n equals 1 out there, air. In the plastic, n equals 
I don't know, you can get plastics with different values of n. Let's just say it's 1.5. And then in for the whole, we'll put back to one again. It's either air or vacuum. What happened to that ray that hits this flat interface? Ben? It's so up or down. If, I, if I'm going to think about the ray hitting that flat interface, the first thing I'm going to do, do is draw a perpendicular line. If I draw a perpendicular line, what does that line look like? It looks like it's along the ray. So what's the angle between the ray and that perpendicular line? Zero. So that angle, sine of that angle is... Sine of zero, zero is zero. Sine function, you guys have been drawing sine functions for weeks now. Sine function starts out at, at zero. The sine of zero is zero. So if that's zero on the left, then the right has to be zero, which means the right angle has to be zero, which is just another way of saying the ray goes straight through. If the ray hits perpendicular to the interface, then it goes straight through. So the first interface, although the speed changed, the angle didn't because it was already 90 degrees. Sorry, it was already zero degrees. It was already along the perpendicular. So theta was zero degrees. The next interface, not zero degrees anymore. Same thing down here. The first ray hits perpendicular. It goes straight through. The next interface, not, inter not uh, at zero degrees. So draw in a perpendicular to the interface. Sketch what happens when it goes from the slow plastic into the fast air. And then when it goes through the air, it comes out somewhere else. So you've got another interface. There's really three interfaces four if it ever gets out of that plastic back into the air. There's at least three interfaces that you have to worry about right now. And then answer the question, does this focus light rays onto a point, are light rays focused to a point from which they then diverge? Or are they diverging away from a point that they never actually came from? So that's the question here. By the way, this is meant to be ordinarily if you have a lens, it's just a, it's a thing made out of plastic or glass, but usually plastic these days, and it looks like that. And it's embedded, it lives in air, so a lens just sits in air. This is the opposite of that. This is, the, the thing that's shaped like the lens is, uh, is made up of air. And it's embedded in plastic. So instead of the plastic living in the air, in this problem here, the air that, of that shape is living in the plastic. So sketch the pictures. Use Snell's law, at least in your head. Yeah. What do you do first? Well, you draw a perpendicular line. There's an interface. So you draw a perpendicular line to that interface. This interface, perpendicular line, looks like that. I'm probably not drawing very well, but you'll get the main idea. If it went straight through, it would go like that. If it does not go straight through, whoops.
All right, we are running out of time, so I want to get through this. Just a show of hands, how many say it's a diverging that rays diverge? And how many say that rays converge? Okay, so let's see. Um, there's the perpendicular line. Here's what would happen if the speed didn't change. But the speed did change, it goes faster. What happens if it goes faster? Bend toward the perpendicular line or away? Away. So, so it's not straight through. It's farther away than perpendicular. This would be perpendicular. This is farther away. What about this next interface? Well, draw a perpendicular. If it went straight through, it would go like this. Does it bend toward the perpendicular or away? Because now I slow down again. So toward. So I don't go straight through. In fact, I go even farther up that way. I went a little too close to the perpendicular because I'm having trouble drawing these lines. Same thing down here. That would be straight through. Bends away and then it bends toward. What happens here? Well, it doesn't matter very much, for one thing, since I can't draw it, but here it goes faster again, so it goes away from perpendicular. In any case, if I, let's just take these, these two right here. If I extrapolate those back, they look like they came from there. They were not, this thing was not, these rays do not come down to a point. They were, this, this thing bring, diverges them so that they look like they came from this point, but no rays actually ever came from that point. This is meant to be, so that you'll think about things carefully, it's meant to be the opposite of a lens that that you would see where the lens is the slow thing. The light is slower in the lens than it is in the air. This is the opposite of that. 